Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mastering Quantum Mechanics Through Problems. My name is Dr. Jacob Hudis. In this presentation, I will solve a good problem that helps to understand some key operations in quantum mechanics, including finding the expectation values of position, momentum, and energy. To begin, I present the solutions to an infinite square well potential. This was solved in a previous video, and the link to that video will be in the description. Each wave function, phi sub n, depends on the quantum number n, and it represents an energy eigenstate in the position basis for a particle in a one-dimensional potential well. For example, when n equals 1, phi 1 corresponds to the ground state, when n equals 2, phi 2 represents the first excited state, and so on. In quantum mechanics, when a particle has a specific energy value, it does not have a precise position or momentum. Instead, it has a spread of position values in position space and a different spread of momentum values in momentum space. This is the wave function in the position basis, and at a time t equals zero, it's in an equal amount of the n equals one and the n equals two energy no eigenstates. Way. Here's the problem that I'll be solving. We were given the wave function at t equals zero, a, plot the initial probability density as a function of x. Part b, determine the wave function psi of x and t of the particle and compute the corresponding probability density as a function of time. Part C, calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Another way to say that is find the average energy of the particle as a function of time, given that this is the initial wave function. Part D, compute the expectation value of the position operator x. This is the standard formula in quantum mechanics of how you find the expectation value of x. That's the average value of x. I'll explain this more when I solve part D. Part E is similar to part D, but it's asking for the expectation value of momentum, not of position. Part A asks us to find the initial probability density. That's the probability density as a function of x at time t equals zero. The rule of quantum mechanics is the probability density is equal to the wave function squared. This is a fundamental postulate of quantum mechanics. It came from the scientific method. That's an important part of the lesson of this problem that in, if you're asked to find the probability density, which is a map of the probability of where you'll find this particle, the rules of quantum mechanics tell us that the probability density is equal to the wave function squared. The wave function at time t equals zero is an equal linear combination of phi one and phi two, where phi one is the energy eigenstate corresponding to energy E one, and phi two is the energy eigenstate corresponding to energy E two, and these are written in the position basis. Once we have our initial wave function to get the probability, we take the wave function and multiply it by itself. To be technically correct, it's the wave function complex conjugate times itself, but because this wave function is real, we don't need to worry about the complex conjugate in this part of the problem. This is the probability density. It would be phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared plus 2 phi 1 phi 2. If we use the explicit form of phi for this potential, which is the infinite square well potential, then we get the probability distribution is given by this function. A is the width of this box. It's gonna be a very small number because we're dealing with quantum mechanics. This expression can be made a little more pretty, a little more aesthetically pleasing just by writing it this way. This and this are the same. These are the probability density of the particle. This is a plot of the probability density for A is equal to one. What this tells us is that time T equals zero, the particle will be likely to be found in this region of the box. It will never be found at this location. It will never be found at this location, and it will have a small probability to be found here. That's what the probability density tells us in quantum mechanics. Bingo! Part B asks us to find the wave function and the probability density as a function of time. The rules to find how the wave function evolves in time are governed by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Ultimately, the rule is this. You're initially given a state at time t equals zero. That state at time t equals zero has to be written in terms of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. If it's not, you have to decompose it into eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. In this particular example, the state is already given to us in terms of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, energy E1 and energy E2. Once you have this, you multiply each one of these by a phase factor, e to the minus i e n t over h bar and e to the minus i e n t over h bar, where n is the quantum number associated with the energy. In this case here, it's going to be e to the minus i e1 t over h bar times phi 1 plus e to the minus i e2 t over h bar times phi 2. That's how you find the wave function for all time t greater than zero for any quantum mechanics problem. Shut the front door. I'm loving this physics lesson. Please tell me much more. 
For this particular potential, the infinite square well potential, we know that En is equal to n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. For E1, you replace the principal quantum number n with 1, and therefore E1 is equal to pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. It's a fundamental rule in quantum mechanics that energy is always equal to h bar omega, so I can set this equal to h bar omega. E2, I replace n with 2, and then we get 4 times this expression, and therefore E2 can be written as 4 times h bar omega. For this problem, E1 divided by h bar is this over h bar, which is omega, and E2 over h bar is this over h bar, which is 4 times omega. Therefore, the way that the wave function evolves with time is equal to 1 over root 2 e to the minus i omega t phi 1 plus e to the minus i 4 omega t times phi 2. That's the solution. It makes it easier if you can factor out an overall phase and have the argument of each one of these exponentials have the same magnitude. To simplify the mathematics, for this problem, I can factor out a phase of e to the minus i 5 halves omega t, and then I get this phase factor times 1 over root 2 e to the i 3 halves omega t phi 1 plus e to the minus i 3 halves omega t times phi 2, and this is our wave function psi of x and t for any time, and this is the procedure to find the wave function at any time for any quantum I'm thrilled mechanics beyond problem. Words. This is incredible. Harvey also asked us to compute the probability density as a function of time. Well, this is something we already know how to do because I calculated a probability density in part a. We just calculated the wave function for all time. The probability density is the wave function squared. So I take the wave function, complex conjugate, I change the sign in front of the i's. This plus i becomes negative i, this negative i becomes plus i. I take the complex conjugate of the phi's, although they're real, which means phi 1 complex conjugate is just equal to phi 1, and then I multiply it by the original wave function. When you do that, the math is here, it's easy to follow. When you get down to this line, I can factor out a phi 1, phi 2. e to the i 3 omega t plus e to the minus i 3 omega t is just equal to 2 cosine of 3 omega t. What you're left with is the formula at the bottom, which is the probability density for all time. This is the probability density as a function of time when you're in a linear combination of eigenstate 1 and eigenstate 2. As you can see, the probability of finding the particle is oscillating between the right side of the box and the left side of the box. Right now, there's a high probability to find it on the right, and then it switches to the left, and this is what's happening when you're in a linear combination of two eigenstates. This is unreal. I'm so stoked. Math and Physics Tutoring with Dr. Hudis. Part C says, find the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. What that means is find the average energy of this particle. If you made many measurements of the energy of this particle, what would the average be? In order to compute the average of any operator in quantum mechanics, the rule is, for any quantum mechanics problem, the average of h or the average of any operator would be bra psi of t h ket psi of t. For this particular problem, we know what psi of t is. It's equal to 1 over root 2 times this phase factor times ket e1 plus 1 over root 2 times this phase factor times ket e2. If I take h, which is the Hamiltonian, and act it onto psi of t, this operation multiplies ket e1 by the eigenvalue e1, and it multiplies ket e2 by the eigenvalue e2, bra psi of t h ket psi of t, this equals to the sum over n of each coefficient squared multiplied by e n, in this case there's two n's, c1 is equal to 1 over root 2, c2 is also equal to 1 over root 2, e1 is equal to h bar omega, e2 is equal to 4 h bar omega, what we find is for this problem, when the particle is prepared in a state, which is a linear combination of the n equals 1 and n equals 2 eigenstates of the infinite square well, that the average energy is equal to 5 halves h bar omega. Part D asks us to find the expectation value of the position operator. What that tells us is what is the average value of position. The average value of energy didn't change over time, but what we're going to find in this case is that the average value of the position does change over time. For this one-dimensional problem, we take the integral from 0 to a of x times psi squared dx, and this is equal to x times the probability of x, which is intuitive. Because we know that psi squared tells us the probability density, if we multiply psi squared times x, that tells us the average value of where we're going to find the particle. We know psi squared of x comma t is equal to this expression, so we take this expression, we multiply it by x, and we take the integral. I don't go through and show you the calculation to do the integrals. You can do these integrals on your own, they're non-trivial, 
But at the end of the day, the average value of x is equal to this expression and it's changing with time. That should make intuitive sense based on the animation we just saw for the probability distribution of x, which is changing over time. Part E says, find the average value of P, that is, what is the average value of the momentum of a particle when the particle starts in a linear combination of the first two eigenstates of the infinite square well potential? In order to get the average value of any quantity in quantum mechanics, you take the wave function psi star, and then you take the operator, and then you take the wave function psi. So before, we had psi star x psi, and that worked out to be x times psi squared. If we're calculating the expectation value of momentum, we have to take psi times, and then put the momentum operator here onto psi. The momentum operator is minus i h bar d by dx. This function is psi minus i h bar d by dx onto psi is this expression that just comes from taking standard derivatives. And so then the average value of p of t is equal to some constants that come out in front times psi star, the complex conjugate of psi, multiplied by this expression, which is related to the derivative of psi. And then you take this integral. And when you do that integral, that gives you the average value of the momentum of the particle. I don't go through and perform the integral, but if you were to go through and perform the integral, what you would find is that the average value of the momentum is given by this function. Finally, I want to talk about something which I'll do in the, in the next problem, which is the Ehrenfest theorem. And that says, for certain situations, the average behavior of a quantum system follows the same rule as in classical mechanics. This doesn't happen all the time. This is only in certain situations. If I take the derivative of this function with respect to time, that would give an average velocity. And then if I multiplied that by m, that would be an average momentum because m times average velocity is average momentum. And this expression is the same expression that I got performing the tedious integral on the previous part of the problem.